So let's talk about sex. <laughs> Actually, let's talk about sex education, which is just as fun. If I think about one of my earliest memories about sex education, it was in the fifth grade. The teachers were really nervous. They broke us up into boys and girls. And as a boy, I was put in one room. We watched a really poorly animated video about puberty and wet dreams. And then we got a travel-sized deodorant and were sent back to class. <laughs> All I remember is being jealous. Why was I jealous? Because the girls got a paper bag of goodies. <laughs> Now, I had no idea what they had. Turns out it was deodorant, a pad, and a tampon. I didn't know what those were for, because we didn't learn. But I was just jealous and confused, and then just went back to class. As a sex health educator now, This is an experience I keep with me of what not to do. That lesson, that introduction to sex education, was not inclusive at all. They broke us up into binary genders. We didn't learn anything about other genders or other sexes. And then there was no follow-up. We got deodorant. <laughs> yeah. And that's something that I strive for. I strive for inclusive, queer-inclusive, trans-inclusive sex education in my work. One of the reasons that sex education is not inclusive, though, is an idea that I like to call compulsory reprosexuality. Uh, that's a big theory term, but break it down for you. Compulsive is mandatory, and reprosexuality, reproduction. Basically, it's a cultural notion that we're all expected to, and, or it's the norm, to reproduce. So we all know this as a really common nursery rhyme. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. That line of thought and that narrative is something that's often used against people or to discipline people. As somebody myself who doesn't want to reproduce, because I have lots of kids because I teach and I like to go home alone, <laughs> I often get from students and other adults You don't want to have kids? And it's like, no, I'm fine. But there's a bit of a judgment there. And when people say, oh, I don't want to have children, you know, that can ruin a, a, a would-be grandmother's day. Or mother-in-law going, hey, where are my grandkids? Or a father going, where, where am I going to have a, a grandkid to have fun with? When it comes to sex education, though, this infiltrates in a lot of really problematic ways for inclusion. Because if we think of sex education like this, that model doesn't fit everybody. Now, how that fits into sex education is that we often talk about sex education, and my job is funded by a grant for teen pregnancy prevention. So the idea of preventing teen pregnancies is itself also a problem, because teens and youth have the right to make decisions about their own reproductive health. So what we're actually doing is trying to educate for unintended pregnancies, pregnancies that are mistimed or not wanted. Like, ah, I didn't know that was going to happen. But in the meantime, when we do these programs, many of these programs are given to us from different places. They focus on heterosexual penis and vagina leading to reproduction sex. That's considered the norm. So if that's considered the norm, We don't get to talk about a whole lot of other sexual acts, the whole spectrum. So I do say I do a program, and I, this has happened to me. I tend to have really outspoken youth, which is great. And I'll have a youth who's a self-identified lesbian go, hey, this doesn't matter to me. I'm a lesbian. I don't picture myself having sex with somebody with a penis ever. And that's their worldview. That's their identity. And so, yeah, if I'm talking about external condoms and birth control, this isn't relating to them. And you may think, well, maybe she has a point. She's not necessarily thinking about having sex that could lead to reproduction. So why does she need to learn it? Maybe she should have some other kind of sex education. That brings up some issues for me about separate but equal. We'll put that aside, because that's a problem. Instead, we also have to admit that queer youth do have unintended pregnancies. And you may go, really? 
But there are many instances where a queer youth might have sex that results in a pregnancy. For example, if somebody is dealing with internalized homophobia, they may act and do certain things, they may have certain kinds of sex that they don't want, but to be perceived as heterosexual, or to be perceived as themselves as heterosexual. So all it takes is that one time, somebody, a gay man perhaps, takes a girl out for prom, does some stereotypical acts, just that one time you have an unintended pregnancy. There are also times when people just feel forced socially into that. We also have to admit that queer youth are often the subject of different oppressions and disparities. So they may have to result or go into sex, uh, sex work, trading sex for money, or survival sex, trading sex for some sort of shelter or some sort of food, protection. And queer youth, especially transgender women and transgender women of color, are often targeted for sexual assault and rape. These are all potential acts that could lead to pregnancy, but definitely not on the radar of somebody who might self-identify as gay or lesbian, and definitely not something that maybe people even want to happen. So in these cases, what, do we, what should we do? Well, for the self-identified lesbian in the class, this doesn't relate to her. If I'm just talking about a penis and vagina sex model, it does not relate. And if there's one big education faux pas, it's if you don't teach something that relates to somebody's personal experience, there is no way for it to be incorporated into their knowledge. And so if somebody's worldview is, this is the kind of sex I'm having, this is how I am, this is my, who I am as a person, it's not gonna land. Personal experience, starting college, I go online, because online tells all the answers. How to have anal sex safely. Is that something I learned in class? Is that something I should have learned in class? I would say so. If I wanna be able to have safe sexual encounters, my sex ed program should provide that information. And considering that I was a sponge in school, I did not get that at all, so I'm pretty sure it wasn't there. <laughs> but that also is making me, like I'm maybe a little bit weird because I'm looking up how to do things safely. That's not on the forefront of people's minds. That's not on the forefront of a youth's mind about to gauge in sexual contact or sexual intercourse. And so including a variety of sex acts, including the spectrum of sex identity, of gender identity, is going to be able to include LGBTQ youth. But it's also gonna include everybody else. Because do heterosexual people just have penis and vagina sex? No. Some people do, but there's many other sexual acts that people have that maybe there's something to learn about safety. Maybe there's something to learn about pleasure. Maybe there's something to learn about how to do it better. So this idea of queering sex ed is gonna be good for everybody. Because reducing sex to a biological function removes everything that makes it human to us. So I have a couple things that I think we can do to try to work on this problem. I'm a sex health educator, so I try to do it on my own, but we need everybody. The first is thinking about why we don't talk about sex. In our culture, we have a lot of puritanical roots in United States culture, and those often make sex seem dirty or immoral. And we need to acknowledge that those things can cause shame and stigma when people want to talk about sex. Second, we need to talk about pleasure. If we talk about sex, and we don't talk about that some people do it for pleasure, anybody who has had sex for pleasure is not going to relate to it. They're gonna go, what's this person talking about? That's just functions. This is something else I'm doing over here. So they're not gonna to connect to it, they're not gonna to relate to it. And third, I really uh, encourage everybody to be advocates for sex education. As somebody who's worked with principals, administrators, and teachers, 
they're often very scared about what parents, guardians, and the community are going to do. You know, somebody wants to teach sex health in a health class, and the first thing is, what are the parents going to think? Are they going to riot? So as parents, guardians, community members, what is being taught in your schools? What is being taught to the youth and the people that are growing up and becoming part of the community around you? So those three things, talk about why we don't talk about it, talk about pleasure, and talk about what is being taught and how can you ad advocate for an inclusive sex ed. And to me, that's a really great way for having queer sex ed for all. Thank you.